OK, so we're going to attempt to derive Euler's formula using this limit definition of e raised to a power. So this is quite an interesting problem, historically speaking, because e raised to a certain power, this would have been the first definition that was available to mathematicians back in the 17th century. So now, this isn't going to be the most rigorous proof. I'm going to skip over some of the fine details. But it is quite a nice way of just working with this limit definition with complex numbers and seeing how this is connected to Euler's formula. So if we start off, we could just think about e to the i theta. Following the definition, this will be defined as the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus i theta over n, all raised to the power of n. And this is quite a nice starting point because there's nothing too involved here. We've just got addition and division with some complex numbers and then raising this to an integer power and then taking limits. So if we were to explore now, just without taking limits, this 1 plus i theta over n all raised to the power of n. We'll be interested in its modulus and its arguments. So if we just start off with the modulus of this, you know that the modulus of any complex number raised to a power, we can just write this as the modulus of that complex number, so the modulus of 1 plus i theta over n all raised to the power of n. And this is quite easy to work out just using some Pythagoras here, because this is split into its real and imaginary parts, as long as theta is real. So then you've got the square root of 1 squared, which is just 1 over plus theta squared over n squared, all raised to the power of n. So then we can write this as 1 plus theta squared over n squared to the power of n over 2. And you can see this is starting to reflect some of the structure we see in our definition of e raised to a power. And if we were to replace our power of n over 2 by a power of n squared, we'd have 1 plus theta squared over n squared raised to the power of n squared, which, as n squared goes to infinity, Following our definition, this would give us e to the power of theta. But unfortunately, our power is n over 2, not n squared. So in order for these to be equal, you could raise all of this to a power of 1 over 2n. Then you'd still get a power of n over 2, which is still interesting because you've got something inside your brackets there, which, as n goes to infinity, this is going to converge to e to the theta. But of course, we can't really take limits and then take limits on the outside as well. There's much more nuance there. But we've still got something which is going to be a constant, which is raised to a power 1 over 2n, which is going to be converging to 0. So we can say that as n gets bigger and bigger, this is going to be roughly equal to some constant to the power of 1 over 2n, which will converge to the constant to the power of 0, which would give you 1. So of course this isn't a very rigorous way of doing this. If you wanted to if you go slightly more rigorous with your approach, you could say 1 plus theta squared over n squared to the power of n squared. We know that this converges to e to the theta, so eventually for large enough values of n, this will be less than or equal to e to the theta plus some small epsilon, and it will also be greater than or equal to e to the theta minus this epsilon. Then if we just raise everything now to the power of 1 over 2n, this will hold for all large enough values of n then you can see that your upper and lower bounds, your constant to the power of 1 over 2n, both of these will just converge to 1. So you can see that this is now trapped between two things which both converge to 1. So this just gives a bit of an intuitive feel then for why the absolute value of e to the i theta, the modulus, is going to be equal to 1. Of course, this isn't a rigorous way of doing this because there's some interchanging the order of taking your modulus and limits which needs to be dealt with. But just at an intuitive level, we can now see why the absolute value of this should be 1. Now we'll explore what is the argument of e to the i theta, again following this definition with the limit. So first of all, before we take limits, we'll just look at what is the argument of 1 plus i theta over n raised to the power of n. We can take advantage of some results about complex numbers here. So if you've got the argument of two complex numbers multiplied together, this is essentially just the sum of their arguments. The only problem being now that the argument function we only usually define between positive and negative pi. So you may need to, when you add these two arguments together, potentially add or subtract some multiple of 2 pi to get back within that range. We'll just write plus 2k pi as our possible error term here. And similarly, if you have a complex number and you multiply it by itself n times, you're just adding the argument n times. It's n times the argument of that complex number. Again, where there could be some potential error term. So we can find the argument of 1 plus i theta over n before raising it to the power. And we can take advantage of the fact that n is going to be converging to infinity. So 
as n goes to infinity, theta over n is going to be really small. So our picture will actually just be a right-angled triangle like this, this angle being the argument we're interested in. We know that the real part is 1 and the imaginary part is theta over n, or we could potentially, if theta is negative, we could have an upside-down version of this. But either way, the argument is just going to be arctan of theta over n divided by 1. So this is just going to be arctan of theta over n. And because theta over n is going to be really small for large values of n, we can actually make use of the small angle approximation for tan as well. So you know that if x is really small, then tan x is approximately equal to x. And similarly, we can show that when x is small, x is roughly equal to arctan of x too. So we can say that arctan of theta over n for large enough values of n is going to be approximately equal to just theta over n. So now we can apply this if we think we're interested in the argument of 1 plus i theta over n raised to the power of n. So then this should be equal to n times the argument of 1 plus i theta over n, and then potentially with some error term. So then we get n times the argument of this complex number is approximately theta over n. So this is actually approximately now just equal to theta plus 2k pi. And of course here, as we take limits as n goes to infinity, we can show that the argument will actually be equal to theta plus potentially some multiple of 2 pi. So now we've seen, at least very informally, that following this definition, the modulus of e to the i theta should be 1, and the argument of e to the i theta should indeed be theta, potentially plus some multiple of 2 pi, just to get us back within the range between positive and negative pi. So we can start to interpret this result now. So we've got a complex number whose modulus is 1, and whose argument is given by theta plus 2k pi. So wherever we draw this in the complex plane, we can use a little bit of trigonometry now to show that our real part of this is going to be cos theta plus 2k pi. We've got an angle of theta plus 2k pi here, and the hypotenuse of our triangle will be 1. So we can say that e to the i theta, its real part should be cos theta plus 2k pi, and it's an imaginary part, again using a bit of trigonometry here, we can show should be equal to sine theta plus 2k pi. So now, because theta plus 2k pi, we're just working with some real values here, it's not too much of a stretch to say that we can assume that cos and sine are 2 pi periodic. So we can actually just replace these by cos theta is going to be equal to cos theta plus 2k pi, and sine theta we can replace by sine theta plus 2k pi. So we write cos theta plus i sine theta. So of course there's a lot of steps missing here, but at least at some intuitive level we might have a better feel now for why this limiting definition can still be used for complex numbers and how this makes sense geometrically.